Hello and welcome to Andy's Little Sci-Fi Horror Show. My name is Andy. This is my 10 Earth Minute segment. It appears being on a strange alien planet we will have trouble with. Tribble. Hello and welcome to Andy's Little Sci-Fi Horror Show. And I am Captain James T. Kirk. And we are riding in the USS Toyota. We must continue to our away mission, Mr. Spock. First, we must get some substance. Perhaps in this strange and queer planet, we will find some nourishment. Engage! This is a step out of my Lucas Hound character that I am truly a hardcore Star Wars fan. But, um... I do have to admit, I am a fan of the original Star Trek. This particular episode obviously has a uh, Star Trek theme as we make our way through the mean streets of Worcester, Massachusetts, and this curious planet known as Earth. We make our way to the Boston Super Mega Fest. Mm-hmm. Which is in Framingham this year. The irony. But still the Boston Super Mega Fest. Now the first thing we got to start with with Star Trek is Gene Roddenberry. Fascinating man. Gene Roddenberry was a guy who became a writer and started his writing career actually in the Los Angeles Police Department in the 1940s and then in the 1950s. I did not know that. Where he was a speechwriter and he also wrote for a lot of dramas and cop shows back in the day. It wasn't until like, he finally decided in 1956 to retire. He retired as sergeant from the LAPD and then he went to Hollywood and pitched a television program to Desilu Productions. Ah, uh, yes. Desilu Productions, which was actually owned by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And that program was Star Trek. Yeah, the original pilot actually had Jeffrey Hunter playing Captain Christopher Pike. I just recently watched that. It was shot in 1964, and it just wasn't sold, and he was given a second chance. They said, okay, well, recast the pilot, and we'll give it a shot. And so that's where the second cast came in, and they shot another pilot called Where No Man Has Gone Before. The only returning actor from the original was Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock. You can't beat Spock. No, you can't. Leonard Nimoy was born for that role. When they shot the second pilot, they, they were able to sell it and bring it back on television, on, and NBC aired it for the first season. NBC? NBC. I did not know that. NBC carried the show for the first season, but it didn't do very well in the ratings, because science fiction back in the 60s was kind of hokey and cheap. And a lot of shows that you saw that were science fiction were like Irwin Allen shows like True. Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea or, or uh, Lost, Lost in, in space. space. I was going to say Lost in Space was out at that time. You know, other shows that were notable were like Land of the Giants that he did. Yeah. But Sci-fi had a kind of a um, Gilligan's Island kind of quality to it. The big exactly. problem was trying to make people rethink the sci-fi genre as an hour-long drama. Star Trek was a show that really focused on a lot of counterculture issue. Plus, unlike a lot of science fiction shows at the time, it had a very positive view of how humanity would overcome its uh, demons. A lot of sci-fi beforehand was very dark. It was kind of different and it really kind of hit a core fan base. And when NBC was going to cancel it after the first season, a letter writing campaign, this is in the days before the internet, a letter writing campaign started and it actually saved the show for another two seasons until uh, it eventually NBC said after three seasons, no, nope, that's it, we're done. They shot three seasons of programming, and that was about 76 episodes. And when it came time for it to end, it went right into syndication. Syndication was a big thing back then. You gotta understand, television yeah. back then was not like it is right now, where no. every show in the world can get syndication because there's 25,000 channels to choose from. There were only the big name players back then, NBC, mm -hmm. CBS, ABC. And to get syndication right after your show is stopped, to get syndication right away, mm -hmm. proves A, that the fan base is strong, and that B, they weren't quite sure maybe they should have canceled it or not. When Star Trek went into syndication, it gave, um, the people who weren't on board initially a chance to catch up and make the strong fan base even stronger. These 76 plus episodes became, became cult classics. They became stuff that people study, people 
people just loved it. You know, when a TV show is ongoing and game ongoing and going, there's and there's no foreseeable end. It's kind of hard for new fans to come in and wrap their heads around it. But this, like I said before, had, had the 76 episode. It was strong. It was unique. It was sci-fi like no one had ever seen before, and people were able to embrace it. And not only that, Star Trek actually started the convention circuit. I would guess. I mean, Star Trek debatable. conventions started in like Star 1975, Trek, it, 76. They changed it. They changed the. They changed the whole dynamic of it. Yes, you know? I will give you that. You know, and and of course, Star Trek was a big thing. I mean, everybody was like bringing in like homemade stuff they would create and everything else like that. And, Freaks. And the influence of Star Trek on popular culture, even scientific culture, inspiring people to become scientists and various other people who did like space exploration and stuff like that in the beginning of the cell in the phone be yeah in the beginning of the Remote cell controls phone the cell phone you know seriously the flip phone well, the let's dial it back a little bit well you know i mean the idea of it having that ability i mean you know it's like saying the jetsons invented the microwave we are in the uss toyota making our way to framingham to the super boston mega fest and we are talking we're still talking star trek the characters are pretty iconic. I mean, you got Captain James T. Kirk, played by William Shatner, who is obviously the the hero of the show. He's got a great way of experiencing and expressing the way he speaks. Give us some. Because when he speaks, he gives a pause for dramatic effect. Fascinating. And then, of course, we have Leonard Nimoy playing... Spock. Spock is a Vulcan, but he's also half human because his mother is human. He's constantly dealing with the fact that he feels like he has to prove himself as a Vulcan, but the human half does expose itself every once in a while. Curious. Then you, of course, have Montgomery Scott, the chief engineer of the Enterprise. Of course, Kelly is cap as the uh, ship's doctor, McCoy, Bones McCoy, Bones. Leonard Bones McCoy. Damn it, Jim! I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. Actually, he is. Episode. He is dead now, which is sad. Moment of silence. Same as uh, James Doohan. Moment of silence. Mm. Nichelle Nichols as uh, Lieutenant Ohura, the ship's communications officer. Uh, she was like the first um, African-American to get a regular role like that on television. In fact, another side note, the first interracial kiss on television happened on Star Trek. I bet you didn't know that. I didn't know that. I just find it very humorous that they put the ship's officer of communication in a dress where no one's really going to be listening to what the hell she's saying. Hailing frequencies open, Captain. Um, was that dress really, like, military issue? I'm just wondering. Well, you know, it's the 23rd century. You, you know, you gotta deal with simplicity, I guess. And you gotta ration the material. You don't need to have pockets, because the computers do everything for you, apparently. Then, of course, there's Ikata Sulu, played by George Takei. He's the helmsman of the show. And then, of course, you have Chekhov, who is... No, no, Sulu is the navigator. I'm sorry. Sulu is the navigator, and Chekhov is the helmsman. Oh, wait, there are lots of throwaways. <laughs> yeah, right. we call them the red shirts. Yeah. And if, you're, if, you're, shirt, if, you, if you're being beamed down to a planet and you have a red shirt on, and you're, you're not coming episodes, back. You're not coming back. Uh, Michelle Barrett Roddenberry, because she later married Gene Roddenberry, who played Nurse Chapel. Wait a minute. That's his wife? Yeah. Michelle Barrett Roddenberry. What a creeper. Well, you know. You want a part in my show, baby? <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> The thing was, it was a very good show for the time when it was released in the 1960s, 